Uh, the first thing I want to show you is a little bit about states of matter and particle representations. So first of all, all matter has two characteristics. It has mass and it occupies space. And um, there are some diagrams that you might see on an AP chemistry exam. They look kind of like this, where the little circles represent particles of matter. And so this first box would represent a solid. This would be more like a liquid. And that would be something along the lines of a gas. So if you see that type of representation, don't be surprised by it. Uh, next, this should be some pretty basic stuff for you, physical and chemical changes in properties. So all matter has physical and chemical properties. Physical properties are color, odor, density, hardness, solubility, melting, and boiling points. Things that uh, you can use to describe the substance. Uh, chemical properties are things that you observe when it undergoes a reaction, uh, such as its ability to react with an acid or base, uh, redox reactions, uh, flammability, reacting with oxygen, things like that. Um, if you alter the physical state of matter, but its chemical composition stays the same, that's a physical change. So like tearing a piece of paper in half, that's a physical change. It still has all the properties of paper. Um, melting, freezing, boiling, condensing, those are also physical changes. You're not changing the chemical composition of water when you boil it, for instance. Um, in case you don't know these terms, melting and boiling, um, that's going from solid to liquid, liquid to gas. Condensation is going from gas back to liquid. Freezing is from liquid to solid. Then sublimation is going from solid to gas. And deposition is going from gas back to solid. Those terms come up less frequently. Sublimation is what dry ice does when it goes from a solid to a gas. And deposition, that's how frost forms on a cold winter morning when water vapor in the air turns directly into solid ice. Um, key distinctions here, during a physical change, the forces between the particles, intermolecular forces, are disrupted. Uh, for instance, boiling water, you separate one water molecule from another, but you're not breaking it apart into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Whereas during chemical changes, you are disrupting the intraparticle forces, the forces that are within the substance itself. Um, so during electrolysis of water, um, when you apply electricity to water, don't try this at home, um, it will actually split the water molecule up into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, and you get two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about measurements. Um, in chemistry, we often use very large or very small numbers. And so these things are best represented using scientific notation. And so for scientific notation, uh, this would be some examples of things that we could represent in scientific notation versus standard notation. And I'm going to give you some examples of this. Uh, for example, if we have the number uh, 245,000, that could be represented in scientific notation as 2.45 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 to the fifth. Right. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you to see. So those two things represent the same value. Uh, if we're talking about something uh, very, very small, like something that is, say, 0 0.000000003 millimeters, uh, that could be represented as 3 times 10 to the negative, let's see, 1, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, three times ten to the negative tenth millimeters. Okay. 
So if the exponent is negative, it's a negative exponent, that means you are dealing with a number that is less than one. And if the exponent is positive, you're dealing with a number greater than one. Uh, if you're dealing with negative numbers, you put a negative out in front. So for instance, if I put a negative three times 10 to the negative 10th, that would be negative 0.000000003. Um, but let's make that positive again. Um, we use this, for instance, because atoms and molecules are very, very small. So we're talking about very small measurements with them. And that also means when we're dealing with uh, counting how many atoms we have, we're dealing with huge numbers. For instance, we have Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles is per mole. And that written out in expanded form would be 602 10 to the 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. would be 602 point two sextillion uh, particles. So it's a lot easier to write really big numbers in scientific notation or to write really small numbers in scientific notation. So you need to make sure you are intimately familiar with how scientific notation works. Now, if you are using a graphing calculator to put scientific notation in, there is a special button on your graphing calculator, particularly if it's a Texas Instruments calculator. It's the EE -E button. Let me see if I can. Let's see. Create a new page. So let me grab my calculator. So if you're working with a scientific or a Texas instrument style scientific calculator, there's this little button that says EE -E on it. It often shares space with the comma. So if you're wanting to put a number into your calculator, like 3.5 times 10 to the negative sixth, the way you actually enter that into your calculator is 3.5 then you press that button that says the EE -E on it. And then you do negative six. And then your calculator will show on the screen 3.5 E negative six. Now this whole E thing was an invention by Texas Instruments back when calculators used uh, LCD displays and they couldn't show exponents and all that good stuff. So that's the technique that TI calculators developed. But whenever you write something out, like on an exam or a test, you should always write it in scientific notation like normal people do, not like your calculator displays it. Okay. Uh, the reason it's important to use this uh, feature is let's say you're trying to do the following math problem. Uh, 2.7 times 10, well, let me rewrite this. 2.7 times 10 to the 15th multiplied by one over 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd equals. Now, if you don't use the special scientific notation method of putting this into your calculator, when it follows order of operations, if you just write out times and then 10 and the little caret symbol and 15 and 23rd, then what it's going to do is it's going to multiply by one and then it's going to divide by 6.022 
but then it's going to multiply by 10 to the 23rd as if it were on the top. So if you're doing this correctly in your calculator, 2.7 times 10 to the 15th times 1 over 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, you should get an answer of, let me write this, 4.5 times 10 to the negative ninth. And I want you to actually take your own calculator and try this problem and make sure that that is the answer that you are getting. If you're getting a different answer, you need to try it again. If you're still having trouble, you're going to want to uh, consult with me um, about how to better grasp your understanding of this, right? So that's how to work with scientific notation. Um, I'm going to give you a few problems for you to practice with that tonight. And then tomorrow we're going to talk in great detail about significant figures and doing math with significant figures. We're going to talk a little bit more about measurements in chemistry and the units we use with that uh, before we wrap up our lesson for today. So first of all, measurements are quantitative observations, meaning they involve quantitative, meaning they involve numbers as opposed to qualitative observations, uh, which do not involve numbers. And they have two parts. So the first part is a number, and the second part is a unit. For instance, if I said that I walked 100 yesterday, well, did I walk 100 feet? Did I walk 100 miles, 100 kilometers, 100 inches? doesn't mean anything unless you attach a unit with it. So units are a critical part of any measurements that we make. So examples of measurements, 20 grams, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. Um, there are also fundamental SI units, and SI is similar to the metric system um, with a few key exceptions, uh, particularly in the realm of temperature, where the metric system uses Celsius temperature in the SI system we're using Kelvins. These are your fundamental units that we use that we'll be using in this class. So for mass, it's kilograms, length is meters, time is seconds, temperature, kelvins, electric current is amperes, amount of substance is moles, and electrical charge is coulombs. Uh, this little map right here shows the three countries in the world that do not use the metric system or the SI system in common everyday use. Those three countries are the United States, Liberia, and Myanmar, also known as Burma. The U.S. and Liberia use what's called U.S. customary units, you know, feet and miles. Uh, Myanmar uses Burmese customary units, which are different completely. The rest of the world generally uses the metric system or the SI system. Interestingly enough, officially the U.S. government uses uh, SI, but uh, in everyday use, most people are not uh, are not buying liters of gasoline and measuring distance in kilometers. Um, this map right here, which is a little different, uh, you may be able to make out a few uh, Caribbean countries along with Belize in the U.S. Uh, this is countries that use Fahrenheit as opposed to Celsius. So we're really kind of the outliers when it comes to using uh, Fahrenheit for temperature. All right. Um, then these are the metric prefixes. Uh, you've got, these are your common metric prefixes, giga, mega, kilo, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, and pico and what they mean as far as your exponents. 